In the bosom of one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson, at that broad expansion of river denominated by the ancient Dutch navigators as the Tappan Zee, and where they always prudently shortened sail and implored the protection of St. Nicholas when they crossed, there lies a small market town of rural port, which by some is called Greenberg, but which is more properly and generally known as Tarrytown. This name was given, we are told, in former days by the good housewives of the country, from the inveterate propensity of their husbands to linger about the village tavern on market days. Not far from this village, perhaps about two miles, there is a little valley, or rather a lap of land among high hills, which is one of the quietest places in the whole world. From the listless repose of the place and the peculiar character of its inhabitants, who are descendants of the original Dutch settlers, this sequestered glen has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow, and its rustic lads are called Sleepy Hollow Boys throughout all the neighboring country. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere. Certain it is the place still continues under the sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people, causing them to walk in continual reverie. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots, and twilight superstitions. Stars shoot and meteors glare oftener across the valley than in any other part of the country. The dominant spirit, however, that haunts this region and seems to be commander-in-chief of all the powers of the air is the apparition of a figure on horseback without a head. It is said by some to be the ghost of a Hessian trooper whose head had been carried away by a cannonball in some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War, and who was ever anon seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of the night as if on the wings of the wind. His haunts are not confined to the valley, but at times extend to the adjacent roads, and especially to the church at no great distance. Indeed, certain of the most authentic historians of those parts allege that the body of the trooper having been buried in the churchyard. The ghost rides forth to the scene of the battle in nightly quest of his head, and that the rushing speed with which he sometimes passes along the hollow, like a midnight blast, is owing to his being belated and in a hurry to get back to the churchyard before daybreak. In this by-place of nature there abode in a remote period of American history, that is to say, some thirty years since, a worthy white of the name of Ichabod Crane, who sojourned, or as he expressed it, tarried in Sleepy Hollow for the purpose of instructing the children of the vicinity. He was tall but exceedingly lank, his whole frame most loosely hung together, to see him striding along the profile of a hill on a windy day, with his clothes bagging and fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for some scarecrow loped from a cornfield. He was, in fact, an odd mixture of small shrewdness and simple credulity. His appetite for the marvelous and his powers of digesting it were equally extraordinary, and both had been increased by his residence in this spellbound region. Another of his sources of fearful pleasure 
was to pass long evenings with the old Dutch wives and listen to their marvelous tales of ghosts and goblins and haunted fields and haunted brooks and haunted bridges and haunted houses, and particularly the headless horseman or galloping Hessian of the hollow as they sometimes called him. Then, as he wended his way by swamp and stream and awful woodland to the farmhouse where he happened to be quartered, every sound of nature at that witching hour fluttered his excited imagination. The moan of the whippoorwill from the hillside, the boding cry of the tree toad, the dreary hooting of the screech owl, or the sudden rustling in the thicket of birds frightened him to roost. His only resource on such occasions, either to drown thought or drive away evil spirits, was to sing psalm tunes. Rock of ages, clap for thee. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy river side which flowed be a sin the double cure, save me from its guilt and power. Could never sin erase. Thou must save and save by grace. Among the musical disciples who assembled one evening in each week to receive his instructions in psalmody was Katrina Van Tassel, the daughter and only child of substantial Dutch farmer. She was a blooming lass of fresh eighteen plump as a partridge, ripe and melting and rosy-cheeked as one of her father's peaches. Ichabod Crane had a soft and foolish heart toward the sex, and it is not to be wondered at that so tempting a morsel soon found favor in his eyes. Could my feel no rest but no More especially after he had visited her in her paternal mansion, Old Balthus Van Tassel was a perfect picture of a thriving, contented, liberal-hearted farmer. He was satisfied with his wealth, but not proud of it, and piqued himself upon the hearty abundance rather than the style in which he lived. His stronghold was situated on the banks of the Hudson, in one of those green, sheltered, fertile nooks in which the Dutch farmers are so fond of nestling. From the moment Ichabod laid his eyes upon these regions of delight, the peace of his mind was at an end, and his only study was how to gain the affections of the peerless daughter of Van Tassel. A beauty for a beauty. Okay, I'd come up to her, and I'd say, Katrina, dark, beautiful angel. Let me tell you, sir, you shall find no better champion for your goddess, for your uh, princess of a daughter. It is a summer's day compared to the light lies in your, uh, your beautiful face, your long, elegant mane. She who is an angel and I, a man of intelligence and worldly knowledge, R. I'll come back to R. I. Yeah, I thought so too. Ah, Katrina. In 
this enterprise, however, he had more real difficulties than generally felt to the low of a knight errant of yore. Among these, the most formidable was a burly, roaring, roistering blade of the name Abraham, or according to the Dutch abbreviation, Bram van Brunt. He was broad-shouldered and double-jointed with short, curly black hair and a bluff but not unpleasant countenance. He was famed for great knowledge and skill in horsemanship, being as dexterous on horseback as a Tartar. And with all his overbearing roughness, there was a strong dash of waggish good humor at bottom. <laughs> This rantipole hero had for some time singled out the blooming Katrina for the object of his uncouth gallantries. <laughs> and though his amorous toings were something like the gentle caresses and endearments of a bear, yet it was whispered that she did not altogether discourage his hopes. Such was the formidable rival with whom Ichabod Crane had to contend, and considering all things, a stouter man would have shrunk from the competition, and a wiser man would have despaired. He had, however, a happy mixture of pliability and perseverance in his nature. Ichabod, therefore, made his advances in a quiet and gently insinuating manner. Certain it is, this was not the case with the redoubtable Brom Bones, and a deadly feud gradually arose between him and the preceptor of Sleepy Hollow. In this way, the rivalry for Katrina's heart went on for some time. One afternoon, at the school door, Ichabod was given an invitation to attend a merrymaking or quilting frolic to be held that evening at Herr Van Tassel's. It was a fine autumnal day. The sky was clear and serene, and Nature wore that rich and golden livery which we always associate with the idea of abundance. The forests had put on their sober brown and yellow, while some of the trees of the tenderer kind had been nipped by the frost into brilliant dyes of orange, purple, and scarlet. It was toward evening that Ichabod arrived at the castle of Herr Van Tassel, which he found thronged with the pride and flower of the adjacent country. Ichabod prided himself upon his dancing as much as upon his vocal powers. Not a limb, not a fiber about him was idle, and you would have thought St. Vitus himself, the blessed patron of the dance, was figuring before you in person. Several of the Sleepy Hollow people were present at the Van Tassels, and as usually, were doling out their wild and wonderful legends. Many dismal tales were told about 
funeral trains and mourning cries and wailing heard and seen about the great tree where the unfortunate Major Andre was taken and which stood in the neighborhood. It was the very witching time of night that Ichabod, heavy-hearted and crestfallen, pursued his travel homeward along the sides of the lofty hills which rise above Tarrytown. All the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard in the afternoon now came crowding upon his recollection. He had never felt so lonely and dismal. He was, moreover, approaching the very place where many of the scenes of the ghost stories had been laid. In the center of the road stood an enormous tulip tree. Its limbs were gnarled and fantastic. The common people regarded it with a mixture of respect and superstition. As he approached the stream, his heart began to thump. He gave his horse a half score of kicks in the ribs and attempted to dash briskly across the bridge. But instead of starting forward, the perverse old animal made a lateral movement and ran broadside against the fence. In the dark shadow of the grove, on the margin of the brook, he beheld it. Something huge, misshapen, black, and towering. It stirred not, but seemed gathered up in the gloom like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveler. The hair of the affrighted pedagogue rose upon his head with terror. What was to be done? To fly and turn was too late, and besides, what chance was there of escaping ghost or goblin if such it was? which could ride upon the wings of the wind. Just then, the shadowy object of alarm put itself in motion, and with a scramble and a bound stood at once in the middle of the road. He appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions. Ichabod, who had no relish for this strange midnight companion, now quickened his speed. The stranger, however, quickened his horse to an equal pace. There was something in the moody, dogged silence of this pertinacious companion that was mysterious and appalling. It was soon fearfully accounted for. On mounting a rising ground, which brought the figure of his fellow traveler in relief against the sky, gigantic in height and muffled in cloak, Ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving he was headless. His horror was still more increased on observing that his head, which should have rested on his shoulders, was carried before him on the pommel of his saddle. He rained a shower of kicks and blows upon gunpowder, hoping by a sudden movement to give his companion the slip. But the specter started full jump with him, Away then they dashed, through thick and thin, stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound. cheered him with the hopes that the church bridge was at hand. If I could just reach that bridge, thought Ichabod, I am safe. But then 
he saw the goblin rising in his stirrups, and in the very act of hurling his head at him. Ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile, but too late. It encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash. The next morning, the old horse was found without his saddle, soberly cropping grass at his master's gate. The brook was searched, but the body of the schoolmaster was not to be discovered. It is true an old farmer, who has been down to New York several years after, and from whom this account of the ghostly adventure was received, brought home the intelligence that Ichabod Crane was still alive, that he had turned politician, electioneered, written for newspapers, and finally been made a justice of the ten-pound court. He's our judge! He's our judge! He's our judge! Brom Bones, too, who shortly after his rival's disappearance conducted the blooming Katrina in triumph to the altar, was seen to look exceedingly knowing whenever the story of Ichabod was related, <laughs> and always burst into a hearty laugh at the mention of the pumpkin, which led some to suspect that he knew more about the matter than he chose to tell. The old country wives, however, who are the best judges of these matters maintain that Ichabod was spirited away by supernatural means. And it is a favorite story often told about the neighborhood around the winter evening fire. The schoolhouse, being deserted, soon fell to decay and was reported to be haunted by the ghost of the unfortunate pedagogue. And the plowboy, loitering homeward of a still summer evening, has often fancied his voice at a distance, chanting the melancholy psalm tune among the tranquil solitudes of sleepy Hollow. Walk the gates, clever thee.